assalamu alaikum this is lecture 8 of machine learning and in this lecture our focus is to understand the basics of neural networks so here are the lecture contents so as you know we have discussed about the perceptron learning algorithm for a couple of times in previous few lectures now we will extend our discussion to the neural networks and the most common neural network is the multilayer perceptron the neural network comprises of two basic components which are feed forward pass and error back propagation so in this lecture we will also cover these two basic steps of a neural network so as you have seen previously that there are two kinds of learning algorithms as well as two kinds of data so the division is on linear separation so you must be well aware that some of the data is linearly separable that means you can employ a machine learning algorithm to separate the positive examples from the negative examples or from one class to another or in the regression case you can achieve a linear regression but on the other hand some data sets are not linearly separable these consist of some complex mm, phenomena in data sets or even the simple x or problem is an illustration of are non linearly separable data so you may encounter with several cases where you have this kind of data and you cannot employ a linearly separable machine learning algorithm or a linear separator therefore you may come to a conclusion that you have to employ some non linear methods so to employ non linear methods you have two options so in first option as we have discussed in a lecture number 4 that you can employ non linear features that means convert the features into a high dimensional using a polynomial expression and then apply the linear function or on the other hand in the second alternative you can use a non linear classifier so let's discuss both briefly so in the option 1 we have non linear features that mean you converted your input features to a higher dimension so for example you can pick a degree 2 polynomial function and you convert your input feature attribute to a higher degree polynomial and then you choose a classifier which is still a linear classifier in parameters weight and in this way you classify the examples in a high dimension using a linear classifier therefore you have the flexibility and advantage of that this algorithm will be easier to learn because it is again working on linearly separable data and the classifier is linear classifier so the data is linearly separable in higher dimensional spaces so you may have noticed in the previous lecture that when we convert a data from a lower dimensional to a higher dimension there are chances that the data becomes linearly separable the second option is choosing the non linear classifier so in this method you choose a classifier that is non linear in parameters weights for example you can choose a decision tree or in this case for this lecture you can employ a neural network so a non linear classifier is a more general than a linear classifier but it has the disadvantage that it is harder to learn because it requires non convex optimization of the algorithm 
However, these are often very useful and outperform linear classifiers. So whenever you have non-linear data, you can employ any of the method and first choose the non-linear features and if the data is still complex to be managed by the non-linear features and a linear classifier, you can employ the second method in which you choose a more complex classifier which is non-linear with respect to the parameters. So historically neural networks are inspired from the biological neurons. Neurons are the cardinal units in human nervous system and they are responsible to transfer signals from one part of the body to another. And usually our brain has about 20 to power 11 neurons of each which communicate or is connected to 10 to the power 4 other neurons. So typically a neuron receives a signal from an another neuron and to generate an electrical impulse. And it, that impulse consequently produces a signal to other neuron which neuron fires to send the signal to the further neurons. So that signal is then transferred or transformed into another form which is a useful feature or a useful output. So one school of thought is that the neural networks are similar to the biological neurons. However, there are some differences in the studies which use the units in terms of neurons. Anyhow, considering both of the perspectives, we will consider a neural network in terms of a neuron or a unit cell. So, if you recall the neuron metaphor, neuron accepts information from the multiple inputs and then transmit information to other neurons. The similar concept can be applied to the neural networks. A neural network can accept information from multiple inputs and then transfer the information and the calculated value to the next neurons. The neurons can multiply inputs by weights and along edges and similarly neurons can apply some function to set input at each node. So a similar mechanism is shown for a network which consists of a number of inputs which can be provided to a neural network or a neuron. And then we have a multiple weights that are multiplied by the inputs along the edges. And then we have some nodes where some function is applied to calculate the input from the nodes. But if you have a single neuron or a single cell, it is a still linear decision boundary. So what you have to do to make this neuron a neural network? So the simple idea is to tag a bunch of them together. That means cascade the neurons together. The output from one layer is fed to the next layer and the output of a next layer is fed to the other subsequent layers. So each layer has its own sets of weights. So these weights can be applied to the inputs with respect to the edges of the neural network to compute the output of that particular layer. So in this figure you have uh, you can see that there is a two layer network. So in the initial layer we have the input which is fed to 
a hidden layer which calculates the inputs based on the feature attributes and the weight vector and then these outputs are fed again to a final output layer which calculates some function based on the input from the second layer so you can see the first layer is the function of feature attributes x and the weight matrix w1 so once you have calculated this output this output can be fed to the next layer the next layer is marked as y2 which is the function of weight matrix 2 and the output of the first attribute fed as input to the second layer so if you add another layer the subsequent layers will update its methods for calculation as follows so the output of first layer is fed to second layer and the output of second layer is fed to the third layer so this means the neural networks are quite powerful and they have the ability to model complex data so neural networks with the right choice of weights and with the right number of hidden neurons is a universal approximator that means the neural network can represent any kind of data so the problem is that we have the solution but we do not know how to find the right number of hidden neurons and the individual weight values so even if the solution exists there is no guarantee that it will be found based on our current assumption so the capacity of the neural network increases if we increase hidden units or more hidden layers so as an example consider a network uh, which is a neural network of two layers of neurons so neurons in the top layer represent known shapes neurons in the bottom layer represent pixel intensity a pixel gets to vote if it has ink on it so each inked pixel can vote for several different shapes the shapes that get the most votes wins so this means the neuron uh, on the neural network will have two layers the first layer is fed from the input feature attributes so this layer calculates the pixel values and it will get those values where the pixel have some ink on it so once this neural network layer calculates the pixel values for ink contained in those pixels the output of these pixel values is fed to the second layer along with some weights and this neural network layer extract shapes from the pixel values so any shape which gets most pixel values from the previous layer will be the winner shape predicted by our neural network so there are diverse options for you to choose a neuron from setup methods so simplest choice can be a linear neuron which is similar to a linear method or a linear classifier so here is the example of a linear neuron you can also use another commonly used neuron which is logistic neuron or a logistic classifier and the logistic neuron method is represented in this form 1 over 1 plus exponential minus z where z is the method to calculate the output and much similar to the linear neuron you can use a perceptron and in the perceptron you have the 1 and 0 as output and 
one is classified if the output of your method is greater than or equal to zero and zero if the output is not greater than zero. Along with the neurons presented in the previous slide, you can have more options such as using a radial basis function or a soft mass regression as a neuron into your neural network. On the other hand, multilayer perceptron is one of the most commonly used neural network in today's neural network applications. So in the multilayer perceptron, you can connect lots of units together into a directed acyclic drop as shown in this figure. So this gives a feed forward neural network that is in contrast to a recurrent neural network which can have cycles. So as you can see this graph represented here is a acyclic graph that means there are no reverse movement or cycles within the units. So typically units are groups grouped together into layers and the more layers you have the more deep your neural network is. So the layer representation is similar to the linear method which is y is equal to wx. But once you have more layers you can see that each layer is the combination of the input from the previous layer with the weight matrix of that particular layer. So as an example you can see we have four attributes as an input signal to our neural network. So the first layer is the combination of y of 1 is equal to w of 1 means first layer weights multiplied by the first layer out inputs. So at this point you have the y of 1 represented as hidden neuron function. So the output of this neural layer is the input of next neural layer. So for y2 we will have w2 and x2. So x2 is represented as some function of y1. So typically you iterate between linear mapping of weights and non-linear functions. And then finally you have the output signals generated from the output neurons. And in this case our output neurons will be represented by this y2 function. So on this function we generate the output signals which may classify examples from one class to another or predict a value in terms of a regression. So once you have the output value you compare it with the actual values to calculate the loss function which is the difference between the target values and the actual values to measure the quality of the estimate so far into the training data. So the network computes an output based on the input provided to it. So this calculation in neural network is termed as forward pass. So what does the network compute? So as described earlier, the network computes the inputs provided in the previous layer with the attributes vector and the feature weight vector plus some bias term. And this output is fed to the next layer along with the weights of this layer and the bias for this specific layer and finally you calculate the output based on the last hidden layer with the 
weight attributes and the bias term for the final output layer. So the output of the network can be written in the form of hj of x where j is the index of hidden units. So it calculates based on the inputs and our input weight vector and we have the d dimensional input from i is equal to 1 to d. This input is then calculated by each unit into the neural network. So this can be represented by output of the indexed output units by k which is a function of weight attributes for that particular uh, unit bias and the calculation of the weights with the previous output. So this calculation is often referred as an activation function of f and g and the common function for the activations are provided here which are sigmoid or logistic 10h and rectified linear units. So you are very much familiar with the sigmoid representation which is 1 over 1 plus exponent of z minus z. So 10h can be represented in this form. ReLU is a very simple function which represents the maximum between 0 and the calculated output c. So along with the function, the derivatives of the functions are also important in the neural networks and this column shows the derivatives of each function to be employed. So let's take by example that what does the network compute in a forward class and we take the classification example and as represented each class by one output neuron is in this case is y1 or y2. So your task is to present an example and then forward propagate its attributes values to the network outputs. So in this case we had the input attributes x1 and x2 and we fed this to the first hidden layer. So you can see we have input attribute vectors and the weight matrix along with the each edge. So then we have the hidden layer which can contain multiple hidden units. So in this case we have two hidden units in first hidden layer. So you calculate the methods based on the activation function which can be a logistic or 10 edge function. So let's say we calculated a, a sigmoid function and we got the output of h1 and h2 in terms of these values. So these are the outputs of our units into the first hidden layer. These outputs are fed to the next hidden layer as inputs along with the weight matrix for this hidden layer along with the edges. Now you can see these weights are different than the weights of first layer. So based on these assumptions our network computed the final outputs for each class and we can see the output for the first class is higher than the output for the second class. So we label the I uh, neuron with the highest output. Then the output of the highest neuron is the label of the example. So in the neural networks we have a typical assumption that all the attributes are numeric. However, if they are not you have to convert those attributes into the numeric values. So the neural network often face two kinds of problems that 
or cardinal to estimate its performance. The primary problem is to find the weight values. So you can find the weight values much similar to the other network or the other method which we have discussed in the previous slide that is by fine tuning the hyperparameters. But in this case you do not have the direct output of the input examples. Therefore you have to employ other methods. Another problem is that how to find the right size of the network or in other words how many hidden neurons or hidden layers of the neurons are required to accurately map the input data with respect to the output labels. So let's take another example in which you have to classify the image of handwritten digit which is represented in 32 by 32 pixels and you have to employ a binary classifier to check whether or not that image represents the 4 or a non-4. So how would you build your network? For example, you can use one hidden layer and the sigmoid activation function. So your network will consist of an input layer and then one hidden layer which has a sigmoid activation function and then the final output layer. So the next task is to train your network that is to adjust your parameters weight. So you calculate the inputs, uh, the outputs based on the inputs and then based on the error you change or modify the weights to find out the optimal weights. So to find out the weights you apply the loss function. So the loss function in the classification case is the difference between the output labels and the target labels and in the case of regression it is the difference between the target values. So in this case O represents the output of the neural network which is the computation of the input feature attributes and weight matrix. So you have to define a loss function and you can use a simple loss function which is a squared loss which is quite widely used in a regression example or you can use a cross entropy loss. Then you can use the gradient descent algorithm to find out the optimal weights. So the formula to find out the optimal weights using the gradient descent is the WT plus 1 or the weight for the next example R equal to WT minus learning rate into partial derivative of your error function or loss function with respect to the weights. Once you have defined the loss function, you can calculate the total loss of your network. That is the difference between the actual values and the predicted values by your network. And then you can provide these values to the layers of your network to adjust the weights using the gradient descent. For the multilayer perceptron neural network, weight space defines a coordinate for each weight or a bias of the network in all layers. So these are not any different from what we have seen so far. So for the simple perceptron algorithm, we had the weights for each coordinate or each input attribute and a bias term. But if we have multiple layers, we will have multiple of these weight matrices and the bias is for each hidden layer. So just the higher dimensional and just harder to visualize than the single dimensional case. So we want to compute the cost gradient 
which is the vector of partial derivative. So again, we have target attributes or the desired outputs and the real outputs calculated by our function. So let's say for the uh, classification case, we use the cross entropy loss to calculate the loss between the target values and the actual predictions. So this loss will represent the top level layer loss that is the difference between the y of i that is the prediction of your neural network and the t of i that is the actual target. Similarly, you can apply the similar loss calculation function to the subsequent lower layers. Just you have to replace the output of each layer as the output of your network layer. So the y of i is replaced by h of j where j represents the number of hidden layers. And the difference is the actual calculation of the input which you provide to the final or the subsequent layer with the weights of that particular layer. So you can calculate the errors in terms of classification for the output layer using these formulas and for the hidden layers employing these mechanisms. So the goal is to modify the weights in a way that minimizes the error. So if you recall from the previous lecture, we used a loss function to optimize our algorithm for the optimal weights. So for the particular estimation of the weight matrix, we used a score function, so which is the actual prediction of your algorithm. So that function was represented as a function of input attributes, weights and some bias terms and then we defined a loss function that quantifies our unhappiness or differences with this score function across the training data. And finally when we know the differences we come up with a way of efficiently finding the parameters that minimize the loss function which we qualified as optimization. So here we have presented three different examples such as a cat, a car and a frog. So for the case of cat we can see there is a difference between the cat and the frog and there is a high probability that the cat is classified as frog. So this is our loss or the error between the actual score and the predicted score. So we have to find out the parameters that will minimize these loss functions. So let's say we employed a previously unused unnormalized log probability scores of the classes using the formula exponential s k over summation of exponential s j so which is the soft map function where our function s is specified as function of feature attributes and weights and we want to minimize the log likelihood for a loss function to minimize the negative log likelihood of the correct class so we use the log likelihood estimation and in summary we use this formula to calculate the unnormalized probabilities and then normalize these probabilities by dividing with the total value for the calculation. So we can see there is the probability matrix for each of the class. So now we can see that our example is 0.89% unprobable to correctly classify our example as class. That means we are highly unhappy or the, our loss function represents a high value that 
our algorithm is unable to predict the correct class. So once we have the loss estimation of our algorithm, we can use the gradient descent to optimize the weights that will eventually result in decreasing of our loss estimation. So you can use a set of examples to evaluate the gradients based on this loss function and optimize the weights. So a good strategy for the neural network is to use only a small portion of the training set to compute the gradients. This technique is called mini batch gradient descent. And once you are able to calculate the optimal weights, you apply these weights that will result in a decreased loss. So this slide reports the data of the optimization progress for the training neural network using the mini batch approach and the effect of the learning rate. So it is evident that if you use the mini batch approach, the training of neural network results in an optimized loss function. That means the loss function decreases with the increase in the number of epochs. Similarly, if you use a different training or a learning rate, there are different results depending upon the epochs. So using a high learning rate is not very productive. So as you can see, if you use a very high learning rate, the chances that the loss will increase proportionally. On the other hand, if you choose a very low learning rate, the loss will decrease eventually, but the decrease is very gradual and the resulting neural network is not optimum. So similar to this curve, there is a green curve which represents another high learning rate. So in a typically high learning rate but less than very high learning rate, you may experience a significant decrease in the loss early on and then a constant curve that means there is no decrease. Therefore you have to balance between a low and a high learning rate to choose a good learning rate that would result in constant decrease of your loss but gradually it will reach to a minimum loss and that is our goal. So now we have seen that in the neural networks we have two passes. The forward pass is the calculation of the outputs based on the inputs and the weight matrix of the previous layers and in the current layer you have some activation functions and based on the inputs from the previous layer you calculate the outputs of these neurons or units which are fed to the next neural network layer. So to calculate the error you optimize the differences between the outputs of each layer with respect to the inputs of the previous layer or the estimation provided in the training set. And based on these optimization, you adjust the weights. So this propagation of differences or errors towards the network is called back propagation of the error. So this is the reverse or the back propagation path. So this slide shows a simple example of a neural network. So we have a function representation of the attributes x, y and z and we have typical example x is equal to minus 2, y is equal to 5 and z is equal to minus 4. So our function is the calculation of x plus y into z. So we constructed the function x plus y which is equal to uh, another variable 
cube. So x plus y is 5 minus 2 and q is equal to 3. So this result is then multiplied by z and we chose z is equal to minus 4 and the other result is equal to minus 12. So this is the forward path or the calculation of outputs based on the inputs. So now we have to calculate the loss and back propagate it to the previous layer to optimize the weights for the next example. So the simplest way is to use the gradient descent or the partial derivative. So the partial derivative of the output is calculated in the form of f of uh, uh, partial derivative of f over the f. So in this case our f is minus 12 and the constant uh, the derivative is equal to 1. The next step is to calculate the gradient of the previous step as in this case our gradient is the q. So we have to calculate the gradient of function with respect to the q. So our gradient is gradient f partial derivative of f over the partial derivative q. So here is our f, f is equal to qz and when we applied the partial derivative q is termed as the derivative and we are left with the z constant and we have z is equal to minus 4 therefore this derivative will result in minus 4. Now if we explore the q we have x plus y and when we calculate the partial derivative of this function with respect to the x and y we can differentiate between these two. So once we take the partial derivative with respect to x over y is termed as constant and when we take with respect to the y over x is termed as constant. So in the both cases we have the partial derivative is equal to 1. So to calculate the partial derivative of f of x over x we have the chain rule which specifies the calculate the derivative of function with respect to q and then q with respect to x. So we have q over x is equal to 1 and f of uh, f over q is equal to minus 4. So our partial derivative is equal to minus 4 in the both cases. Now again calculate the partial derivative of with respect to z and we have again qz and when you cut out the q the z we will remain with the q. So we will have this derivative is equal to q. So you can use this derivative to adjust the weights. So this sums up a typical representation of a neural network. The forward path is represented in green formation and the back propagation is represented in the red formation. For a particular case you can see we have input x and y and we have a some activation function x which is calculated based on the inputs and this layer then feeds to a next layer and let's say we have an output based on this activation function. So once you have the output you calculate the loss with respect to this partial derivative as in this case the loss is calculated with respect to z and then we calculate the loss of the function which is often referred as the local gradient with respect to layer. This for, in this case the loss is the partial derivative of z with respect to x and partial derivative of z with respect to y. So in many cases you are unable to calculate the gradients directly therefore you employ the partial derivative chain rule such as in this case you calculate the loss with respect to x based on the loss with respect to z and the loss of z with respect to the uh, partial derivative of z with respect to 
x and similarly partial derivative of z with respect to y. So here is another example in which we employ a logistic activation function which is represented as 1 over 1 plus exponent of z and z is represented as w0 x0 w1 x1 plus w2. So our network is marked as w0 x0 product w1 x1 product plus w2. So we sum up first two terms and then sum up with the w2 and then we multiply it with minus 1 and then take exponent with respect to e and then add it to 1 and then divide the whole expression by 1 to calculate our output. So we have different functions here as first function here is the simple multiplication. So which are often represented as f of x is equal to a x. So that is the multiplication of a weight with an input attribute or a feature vector. So we calculate the derivative of this function and we calculate with respect to x and we are trapped with the constant. Our second is a sum and we add some constant with the, with the input attribute and when we take this derivative the derivative of the constant is equal to 1. We have the exponent function and the derivative of the exponent function is similar to its original. We have the 1 over x value and the derivative of 1 over x is represented as minus 1 over x squared. Now much similar to the previous equation presented in the previous slide where we have to calculate the estimation of q into z or x plus y into z. Now we have calculated the logistic estimation based on these inputs and weights. So let's say we had typical weights of 2.0 minus 1 as x0 and 3 minus 3 and minus 2 and minus 3. So we first calculated this multiplication term this was minus 2 and then minus uh, sorry 6 for this term 4 when we added both values 3 and then we added with these w2 we get 1 and when we multiplied it with minus 1 we get minus 1 taking the exponent of minus 1 we get 0 0.37 adding 1 we get 1.37 and dividing 1.37 by 1 we get 0 0.73. Now to calculate the loss and then back propagate it we have to take the partial derivative. So the first partial derivative is represented in the red diagram. So it takes the partial derivative of the output with 1 over x and we have the output of this derivative as minus 1 over x square. So our output 1.37 square is divided by minus 1. Minus 1 is divided by this output and multiplied by our output of uh, subsequent uh, derivative. So we get the next derivative which is minus 0. 3. The next partial derivative is the green one and we can see in this case we calculated the derivative of f of x c plus x because there is the addition operator here. So our this constant is equal to 1 and when we multiplied this with the previous derivative is the same term. The next is the blue derivative which is again derivative of a multiplication 
and it will result in a constant term. So once we take the derivative of sorry the, here we have the constant term with respect to exponential and when we take the exponential which is same as e raised to the power minus 1 and when we multiply it with the next derivative we get 0 0.20 in minus the final derivative is again the constant one and we get the similar value but sign is turned to the positive because the output of the previous term was negative so once we reach to the inputs we calculate the local gradient and we have input and the weight attributes for the first case we multiplied the input weights with it uh, and you can see we can calculate 0 0.4 and minus 0 0.2 represented here similar is the case for w2 and similarly we can apply it to w1 and x1 so at this point you have noticed that we use a logistic regression and the formula we use for the logistic regression is the sigmoid activation function so the derivative of a sigmoid function is represented as 1 minus sigmoid into the sigmoid function so in this uh, example our whole estimation is based on a sigmoid gate so once we replace the values with this function we get the sigmoid function output as 0 0.73 and 1 minus 0 0.73 so all the calculation is based on this sigmoid function so our result is directly calculated from these two values and we have the similar resultant value for the direct sigmoid estimation so the purpose of this illustration is that there are similar kind of scenarios where you use sigmoid gates and you do not have to calculate the particular partial derivative for each step so that means you can directly calculate the sigmoid function partial derivative using a sigmoid gate so along with the sigmoid gate there are other gates in the backward path so these are termed as patterns in backward propagation and you have seen a sigmoid gate which can calculate the sigmoid function estimation with respect to partial derivatives provided by the formula sigmoid, sigmoid function into 1 minus sigmoid function. Other kinds of patterns you have seen are the add gates, which are the gradient distributors. That means whenever you have an AND gate, your gradient is simply distributed across the paths. That means you do not have to worry about the calculation of these paths as well as you can see the gradient of the uh, subsequent path are similar to the previous path. Another common gate to encounter is the max gate which is a gradient router. This means it will direct the gradient to one of the nodes and the remaining nodes will get the zero gradient another common gradient which you have seen in the previous slide is the multiple or multiplier gate which is the gradient switcher so you may have noticed that the gradient is switched for the local gradients calculated in the previous slide so if you go back to the previous slide the gradient you calculated for x is the gradient for the y and the gradient you calculated for the y is the gradient for x so that means whenever you have the multiplication gradient pattern you switch the gradients for the paths so statistically it has been seen that if you increase 
the amount of layers or hidden neurons your error is likely to reduce but if you increase after an acceptable level that accurately maps your data to the target values you are tend to increase the error as well so the amount of neurons on an acceptable level are a good indicator for your neural network but if you increase neurons after that point you tend to overfit the noise in the training data however if you use a too shallow network then your network is too rigid for training and it may underfit the data therefore a good practice is to start with a small network and then train until the error no longer improves and then add a randomly initiated or randomly initialized neurons and then check the error on those neurons so if the training error is decreasing you should keep that newly added neurons and if it does not decrease or it on the other hand it increases you should try to eliminate those neurons so in summary we can see that the neural networks will be very large so there is no hope for writing down the gradient formulas by hand for all the parameters so we have also seen that implementation maintain a graph structure where the nodes implement the forward or the backward procedures so in the forward procedures you compute the results of an operation and save intermediates needed for the gradient computation in memory so this increases the computation cost and which is one add or multiply operation per weight similarly for the backward propagation you employ the recursive application of the chain rule to compute the gradients for the loss function for all the input parameters and intermediates in this case the computational cost is about as expensive as two forward passes so for a multi layer perceptron this means the cost is a linear in number of layers and quadratic in the number of units per layer so backprop is used to train the overwhelming majority of neural network today so derivatives play an important role for the success of neural networks and if the derivatives are correct neural networks can perform much better on the other hand if the derivatives are wrong it may lead you to a wild goose chase so if you implement the derivatives by hand gradient checking is the single most important thing you need to do to get your algorithm to work well gradient descents are an exceptional strategy to optimize your neural networks but these may face the danger of getting stuck in a local minimum of the error function so therefore you must have an adaptive learning rate that means you have to fluctuate the learning rate highly at the start and then gradually decreasing the learning rate however there is a danger of overtraining and overfitting as well with a higher learning rate so in some way you should apply a mini batch stochastic gradient descent in a loop so that you sample a small batch of data and then forward prop it through to the graph to get the loss and then backward prop it to calculate the gradient and then update the parameter using these gradients so to further strengthen the concepts about this lecture you should train a deep machine learning perceptron on the amnist dataset this dataset is a collection of hand written digits and you have been using 
it uh, since the lecture number three in the exercises so you can load it using the keras dataset dot mnis dot load data method and see if you can get over 98 percent precision so in this exercise you should try searching for the optimal learning rate by growing the learning rate exponentially and then plotting the error and finding the point where error shoots up abruptly so you should try adding the similar concepts such as saving checkpoints of your algorithm and early stopping mechanism so this uh, solution of this exercise is provided along with the uh, lecture material and the code file so to train the neural networks and other deep neural networks in python you should install the tensorflow and the keras api along with the other tools that you have already installed so for these tools uh, installation i will recommend using anacoda distribution so if you want to read more about the topics you can go through the chapter 5 of pattern recognition and machine learning book or chapter 5 of the introduction to machine learning reference book apart from that a reading material is provided along with the lecture so this is the end of this lecture if you have any questions feel free to ask me